Well, hey everyone, welcome back to the Worth Your Time podcast. I'm your host, Erica, and today I'm speaking with Kelly Speck. Kelly, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me, Erica. I'm truly delighted. This is an honor. Yeah, well, I think we probably connected um, over Instagram as I connect with most people <laughs> these days. <laughs> uh, um, whether that's good or bad, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I was really, I was intrigued by your story, the story of your family. And so I guess just get us started by telling us about who you are, who your family is, and um, a little bit about yourself. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Kelly Speck. I am married to my college sweetheart, Travis. We, we've been married 22 years, actually May 20th, which is crazy to think about. We've got three kids. Um, Bennett is 14, Jackson is 11, and Reagan is nine. And we live um, in the Maryland suburbs right outside of D.C., just kind of right over the D.C. border, which is always entertaining to be here in the Washington area. But um, I grew up in Fairfax, Virginia, actually, in the Northern Virginia suburbs. And my husband grew up in Nashville, Tennessee. And we somehow met um, in Abilene, Texas, which is a story all in of itself. And we've kind of lived in um, Raleigh, North Carolina, Nashville, Tennessee, but we've been up here in DC the majority of our marriage. Um, and yeah, we just kind of, our story is we started off as two type A control freaks who were just working hard, you know, dinks, double income, no kids, saving for that first house, you know, involved in church, um, you know, involved in service projects, just kind of doing everything that we thought we were supposed to do, like really, um, and then we got pregnant with our first child, and that was so exciting. We found out it was a little boy. We were beyond thrilled. We knew um, that we wanted to have a family, and that we both came from um, strong families, and just we had shared values in that way, and um, I was 38 weeks and four days pregnant. All of a sudden, my water broke, and I was like, here we go, and we had taken all the classes and read all the books and had everything perfectly ready for this baby to come home to the nursery, and um Bennett was born basically as close to stillborn as you can be born. And then it just began a um, 70 day NICU journey with um, lots of just near death experiences, um, trauma along the way. And um, he was discharged, praise God, he lived. Um, but we, we did know when he left the hospital, he had um, suffered an oxygen depletion, had pretty significant cerebral palsy. But of course, um, you know, doctors were very, well, no one was going to say what to expect. They're just said, you know, do lots of therapy and your brains are, you know, very much able to regenerate. And so we came out with lots of hope. Um, and, you know, we're so grateful to God that Bennett had lived. And then we just began the journey of um, seeing, seeing what kind of life he was going to have. And uh, as it's progressed, he is, um, has quadruplicated excuse me, quadriplegic cerebral palsy. Um, he's nonverbal, can't sit, stand, walk, or talk, um, but he is a joy and a delight, and he loves the wiggles and has a huge belly laugh and, um, you know, is just a bright, shining light. And, um, of course, not the, what we expected, um, the way parenthood to start. And then we had a second son and then a surprise baby girl. And so it's just kind of been... Um, parenthood has been one humbling experience after another, as I know it is for so many people, but um, lots of curveballs along the way. And, you know, we just, um, well, we can get into our book and kind of why we decided to write this, yeah. but, you know, through it all, we have felt the Lord's presence. Um, you know, there's no doubt about that. We've been through some really, really, really trying times, you know, depression, anxiety. Uh, my parents went through a messy divorce. I mean, you know, kind of everything you could name has happened, I feel like, throughout our 22 years of marriage. And um, the Lord has sustained us. You know, he's been in our ever-present help. And not because of anything we've done, but because of his grace and mercy and really just his strength. And so we have a really simple story. You know, we're just ordinary people who've kind of lived some really extraordinary events. And we um, as 2020 and 2021 were happening and the world was just filled with hopelessness and anger and everyone was mad at each other. Um, we just felt like, man, we have a story of hope and we feel like maybe the world, this would be an encouragement. And so far, um, we've gotten some really, really great feedback and we're just really grateful for the opportunity. Oh, that's awesome. Well, okay. So I'm going to talk more about your book, but let me back up a little bit to sure. when this happened. So you were not expecting anything dramatic when you when your water broke, right? No, yeah, everything had been pretty, pretty much by the textbook leading up to, um, to my water breaking. Yep, at midnight. And so what, what happened? Why was he almost stillborn? Right. 
That's a great question. We um, basically, I labored through the night and into the morning. And then um, the doctor said, you know what, with each contraction, it looks like his heart rate's going up a little bit. It doesn't look that comfortable. Let's go ahead and do a C-section. And I was like, absolutely. My mom had had three C-sections. You know, I had a quote unquote birth plan, but at that point I was just like, whatever, whatever you guys say. Um, and when they opened me up, he basically wasn't crying. He was blue. His APGAR scores were almost as low as possible. And um, <clears throat> we were first time parents. So we really didn't know what was going on, but the OR was silent. And this nurse just kind of showed me his face and said, here's your baby and ran out the door. Um, and little did we know, you know, they had opened me up and realized, oh my gosh, we've got a major problem. And so we were at one hospital and we were immediately, he was transferred immediately to, um, a, a step up NICU and, um, here in the DC area. And my husband, basically my mom was with me. I was dealing with a, um, a low grade fever. They weren't sure if I had a UTI that had gone undetected that, my amniotic fluid had somehow gotten some bacteria in it. There were just a lot of questions, but no answers at that point. So my mom stayed with me to kind of get me stable. And my husband, Travis, um, who I love and adore, and it's just been a real rock through all of this, but he tells the story that um, as the ambulance was racing to the next hospital with Bennett, um, he was following in his old 1995 black Toyota Camry, and he just felt my life will never be the same. You know, he didn't exactly know what that meant, but um, in an instant, everything had changed. And so, um, yeah, we then, um, then it was put on ECMO, which a lot of people are now familiar with post COVID, unfortunately. Well, well it's a positive ECMO is a, is a life-saving um, life support, which mm -hmm. basically a, a catheter is put into your carotid artery, takes your blood out, puts oxygen in and puts it back in. Then it was on that as a two day old newborn mm -hmm. and um, was on it for 16 days, which is a lot longer than usual. And um, he was doing great on it until the very last day when basically um, he suffered the oxygen depletion. And there's just kind of a whole story around that. So yeah, it was, we've had, you know, after the fact we thought, oh my gosh, is there, you know, should we not have any kids? You know, did I do something wrong? My pregnancy is my body not, you know, what happened? We've had a lot of professionals look at it and everyone has just said, it's like being struck by lightning and the odds mm -hmm. of it happening again are very slim. And so doctors and lawyers and everyone said, still have kids, you know, and, and it's just been a faith journey. I mean, our, basically our whole, <laughs> we went from these type A control freaks to we have no control Lord, we get it. Um, and then handing over the control to the Lord as we've now are, you know, are raising our three kids and at this point really discerning adoption ado adoption and foster care um, because our hearts have just really, really, really um, been turned upside down um, with just the needs of this world and, and just the gift of Bennett and our, you know, our special needs little angel. And then of course our typical quote unquote, typical, whatever that means, um, two younger kids. And um, yeah, you know, there's just a lot of pain in the world and we just would like to be a support in whatever way that can be. Yeah. I mean, there's so many questions I could ask about like so many different directions, but here's the one that I'm going to go towards. So sure. I, I, have seen, I have always wondered, um, you know, for folks that have a special needs kids, when they th talking about having more kids, like that, that would me seem to me very overwhelming. Like you have a, um, already a situation that is, is difficult as a parent. And then, you know, obviously a new baby, no matter what is hard. And so how did you make that decision? And how was that like transition to having a special needs child and then having another child and how far apart are they? Yeah, no, great. That's a great question. Um, so, so Bennett was three when Jackson was born and Jackson was one when Reagan was born. So, I mean, it, it I just feel, I'm like, the Lord has a hilarious sense of humor because, <laughs> um, I, I would say with Jackson, so yes, Bennett was born so, so, so sick. And then coming out of the NICU, God love him. He had had, um, you know, severe oxygen depletion and brain damage. And so he pretty much, if he was awake, he was screaming for the first three to four months. I um, you know, he may have had a raging headache, you name it, sensory overload. He was, he was withdrawing from morphine because he'd been on so many pain medicines in the NICU. And so anyway, it took a while just to get him stable. But by the time Bennett turned one, um, and at that point, soon after he got a G tube, because he eating by mouth became a real um, struggle. And so um, you know, he had a G-tube, he was having seizures, <laughs> he was happy not crying as much. And we kind of just, we were in and out of the hospital, but even between ages one and two, he, he really started to stabilize, stabilize in our, in our world, you know, um, and really because he was our first child. So, so he was the only normal that we knew at that point. Um, 
And I think, you know, deep within our hearts, um, we just longed for, you know, number one, just a normal parenthood experience, you know, birth and parenthood experience, I would say. Um, but I don't even remember specifically praying like, Lord, should we have more kids or not? Basically, the minute doctors um, said, there's no reason why you shouldn't have more kids, we just put it in the Lord's hands and just, because our desire was definitely to have more than one child. And so, um, you know, God answered that prayer. And, you know, I, I do talk about in our book, um, you know, Jackson's our middle child. He's our He's our middle. He's middle in every sense of the way. He has a lot of firstborn tendencies because Bennett's not typical, but he is very much a middle and needs that extra time, that extra attention. Um, but and it's not his job to be everything that Bennett can't be, or you know, never would we ever put that pressure on him. But I do know that the Lord has used ways um, and just healing the crevices of our hearts. You know, just having a baby, a, a normal C-section scheduled. He came out big rosy cheeks, screaming like an old man. Um, he's been the, but really the most healthy, like stout, agile child ever. Um, and, you know, just being able to snuggle him and rock him to sleep at night as, a, as an infant, um, you know, for my husband, just to be able to hear his son say, daddy, you know, you know, obviously for me to, to have um, a relationship with, with my baby boy, you know, in ways that Bennett wasn't able to give us, it's just been extremely healing in so many ways. And I feel like the Lord just knew exactly what we needed. Um, and then bada bing, bada boom, surprised us with this, this tougher than leather baby girl who has the will of, I don't even know who, but, um, you know, I do talk about in the book as well. She was born with the, uh, um, a birth defect and we did find that out at the 20 week sonogram. That was a dagger. I mean, it was, it was a it was a gut punch um, hmm. because we thought, Lord, you're not going to give us more than we, you know, can handle. But oh my gosh, another baby who has to have several surgeries, and hmm. oh my gosh, you know, it was a lot. It was it was very difficult. Um, but if you saw her now, you would never know it because the girl is is um, tougher than all of us, and so strong and beautiful and vivacious. So, you know, I, I mean, all I can say is, parenthood for us has been Kelly and Travis. You have no control. <laughs> reminder you have no control you think yeah. you do you have no control just keep trusting me and that's just um that's all we've been able to do so <laughs> well how has it how has it all affected your marriage because I think I've read a statistic that you probably know um that m majority of marriages of children with special needs end in divorce yeah yeah oh, it's like 80 to 90 percent yeah easily. really high we were actually told that when we um were discharged from, we were in the Georgetown NICU in DC, you know, which is, which, which is the Catholic hospital, but you know, it wasn't like faith-based. Um, <laughs> and she said, she was like, just so you know, I mean, the social worker was doing her best, but she just said, just so you know, this is the most devastating diagnosis any family could ever receive. And your marriage is most likely going to be under assault. So make sure you, you know, do your best to take care of yourselves, you know, bye-bye. And we just, you know, at that point we were in such a fog of survival. Oh we were like, okay worst diagnosis ever and our marriage is most likely going to fall apart okay thank you you know we just and i i i don't even really have words and here's what i will say travis and i were married seven years before we had kids we um we got married very young like 21 and 22 um and i feel like the lord you know in the bible there was a seven years of plenty and the seven years of wine. and we had seven years to build the foundation of mm -hmm. um trust obviously ups and downs newlywed marriage learning everything about each other um we moved 11 times i mean you know we were just literally growing up together but really just also um i feel like the lord was just building a foundation because he knew that we were going to need it and um you know, I do talk about in the book as well. Like there was a, a moment when Bennett was in the NICU at that point, every time the phone rang, it, we were wondering, is this the call we're getting to come say goodbye? I mean, he was on the verge of death for at least the first 40 days. But um, well, there's one night you were just laying in the pit of night, dark, really nothing to say. Because at that point we were so exhausted, there were really no words. And I just remember hearing the Lord say, dig deep. And I'm like, I, I mean, at that point I could, I barely had enough to just get up, eat and like keep myself going, try and feed Travis and, you know, go visit Ben at the NICU. And it's kind of the, this, the night I remember just holding tight to Travis. And, and it was just like, we, we're either going to hold tight to, to each other and get through this, or we're going to just diverge like two paths in the night, because it was so, there was so much pain. There was nothing anyone could say or do. All we could do was cling to the Lord and each other. And 
by the grace of God, we come to each other. And I, and that's easier said than done. And I know for a lot of couples, you know, it takes both people to say, Hey, I'm sticking with you and I'm not going anywhere, even though this sucks so bad. And I'm, my feelings are hurt. God, why are you doing this to us? I mean, all the feelings If we are not at all Pollyanna, like everything's great, special needs kids, nothing to worry about. No, it is grueling. It is exhausting. It breaks you in every way possible. You know, I just, I feel like it strips away everything the world is telling you. <laughs> you be you, you know, be true to yourself, live out your dreams, you know, none of that <laughs> is at all applicable or um, helpful, really. Mm -hmm. You know, when you are facing brokenness in a way you didn't know what was, what was possible, but but the Lord is, is our rock. He, I mean, he's the only thing we have to sustain us. Um, and, and, and that's what we built our marriage on. And, you know, every day is, is a humbling um, journey. You know, we're not saying we've got it all figured out, but I think Travis and I have, have looking back over the now 22 years, seen the Lord's faithfulness of like, yeah, even when I hated you in the summer of 2017, like where well, it was a terrible summer, which I talked about in the book, then it had a double hip surgery and everything that went wrong could have gone wrong. And our little two were old enough to say, mommy, why are you yelling at daddy? Daddy, why did you, you know, it, all of a sudden we were under the microscope in every single way. It was not good. But at that point we said, okay, we need a therapist. We, we need like something, we need help. And um, I'll never forget the therapist when we gave her a close notes version. She said, do you realize that your marriage has been under assault? And like she put words to something that we felt. We were like, yeah, yeah, that's how it feels, you know, and just that, um, you know, I think we both have just had an openness and willingness for help, you know, whenever it got to the point where we knew we couldn't carry it alone. Sorry, yeah. that one, but <laughs> no, you're not. No, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I think, I think thinking like that, your marriage is under assault. I mean, in any situation is important because, you know, I think I, I don't have stats or anything, but I've heard it said that, you know, it, it, one of the easiest ways for Satan to basically destroy all kinds of things that have like a butterfly effect outward is to destroy a marriage and destroy a family. Right. And right. so, you know, that's one of the reasons that I like regularly pray for protection over my marriage because that's like one of the easiest ways for him. And especially if you're dealing with like a situation like you guys were. And so um, I, I, th I think that's also, you know, like one of those ways that families like yours um, need to be supported, you know, more deeply and prepared for, I guess, like through um, church or even just through whatever kind of support community that they are getting at the beginning. But speaking of that, actually, were you connected with a community group or support group when this all started yes, and how has yes. that played into it? Absolutely. I'm so glad you asked that because yes, I mean, yes, the church the Christ died for, yes, has been a huge, huge, huge source of support to us. Um, and that I probably left that out, but Travis and I were both raised, you know, quote unquote, in families who went to church. Were they perfect? No. Were the churches perfect? No. But, you know, I feel like there's this whole new, everyone's mad at the church. Everyone's been complaining about the church. Everyone's deconstructing and blaming the church for everything. And I'm like, no, the church is broken, but beautiful. And, um, and we were both raised in, and when, when Bennett was born, we were attending a church. We had a small group and that small group of people are the ones who, yeah, set up meals for us, dropped, dropped off food, literally when we brought Ben at home from the hospital and I couldn't even see straight, let alone cook. Um, yes, I mean, prayed for us. We had elders coming over, literally praying, driving an hour to just come pray with us. Um, you know, ministers coming to the hospital, praying that Bennett would live. I mean, the, the, the body of Christ, we have nothing but gratitude for because they, they, they met those, there was nothing else they could do. I mean, we couldn't even attend a service day. They had a prayer vigil for Bennett basically on the day that he was about to die. Um, and we couldn't even attend it because we, we were afraid to leave his side in fear that he would, we would lose him when we were gone. And so, yeah, we just, we have, the body of Christ has been beyond beautiful. I mean, we, we moved to Tennessee and we ended up coming back to the DC area and um, actually started attending a different church based on where we were lived, which is McLean Bible Church, which has an incredible special needs ministry, oh, awesome. as well as um, an incredible respite home called Jill's House, which we're very, very, very involved in. Um, and Jill's House is working to um, actually spread uh, campuses across the country because they literally, you don't have to be Christian. Basically, they're just there to support um, families with kids with disabilities because they know the strain that it is on marriages as well as the typical siblings. And so, um, yes, we love the church <laughs> and we are so grateful for um, just anyone and everyone who showed up with us to showed up for us, whether it be prayer, 
a gift card, you name it. They just came alongside. Um, and, you know, there's no way, right or wrong way to do it. You know, I, I, my husband, Travis, has a dear, dear friend who's a pastor in Nashville. And he, he's, you know, what could the church have done better? You know, and it's just kind of like, I, I just don't think there's a prescription. And this is how you do it. I feel like everybody of Christ has different needs. You know, an autistic child is so much different than a child with cerebral palsy or, or a Down syndrome child or just someone who's a little bit, you know, has a genetic disorder. I mean, there's just you just can't put fit anybody in a box yeah. I mean, we're all you know designed so uniquely but I just think um I I have nothing but gratitude for the ways that um the body of Christ has loved us and just showed up for us and um I would never ever say anything but thank you yeah I, I mean I think that's one of many reasons obviously to be plugged into a church but in a time like that you know that kind of community really can be a lifeline. Um, I wanted to ask you also just thinking, you know, being as a mom, like thinking back to those early days, what did it look like to cling to God every day? What did that like tangibly look like? Can you explain like how you connected with God through that time? Because I'm thinking like with my kids in the NICU, my newborn baby, and it's like, you're just going, what do I do? Like, I, I feel like I'd be just walking around like Oh yeah. And running into walls. Totally. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's the thing I have never been. Okay. Number one, I'm not a morning person. I wish I were a morning person who could get up and spend an hour with the Lord before the sun comes up. I have never been that person. I'm up till 2am on the regular, but I, you know, I think, um, for me, it looked like Jesus. I trust you. Like simple, short prayers, like not even an hour long, you know, I mean, if I was spending an hour long in prayer at that point, I was probably asleep. Well, I actually was falling asleep pumping and then in the, the, you know, nursing, the pumping room at the hospital, you know, I mean, it, it, survival mode is so real, especially for new moms. Um, you know, Jesus, I trust you. Um, you know, I remember at that point, I mean, we I mean, definitely had a one-year Bible and the ironic thing is that the passage that I was reading the night that then it was born was Job. And I was mm. like, interesting. Um, yeah. You know, I do think, you know, reaching out to the word in whatever way that would look like, you know, I mean, for us, um, a huge encouragement. We didn't have social media. This is 2007 when Bennett was born, but we did have like a little website that we would update. And um, we would kind of give a daily update and friends and family and even strangers across the world started saying, we're praying for Bennett, we're praying for Bennett, you know, across the world. Um, and just hearing, you know, I love you. You're not alone. You guys can do this. I mean, those, those, I feel like was the way the Lord was speaking to us through other people and just being open to that. Um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, I, there's so much of it as a blur when I think back to that time, yeah. but especially even with just my, um, when my other two little ones were born, I mean, it, we had three kids in three diapers three diapers, three kids and lots of diapers yeah. for um, like three to four years. And so, I mean, yeah. it was pure, my, my husband would roll over in bed, there would be a diaper. I mean, diapers everywhere. <laughs> we were just trying to keep everyone alive, fed, and maybe shoes on their feet, maybe not. Like, I mean, it was, it was, so either I, I'm the last person who's, who's about to say, but make sure you get that journal time in, in the morning, mamas, you know, it's just so hard. And that's just sometimes so not an option, but the Lord knows your heart and he knows um, the meditations of your heart. He knows what you need. You know, I just feel like a lot of times while I was rocking or nursing, you know, just talking to him like a friend is really what brought me the most comfort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like your, you know, I like the, just the comment about like small touch points. Um, I, I often quote this, uh, I heard somebody say one time, you know, a prayer can literally just be one word. It can be help. Yes. And yes. I try to remind myself of that when I'm struggling because, you know, you don't have to get in a prayer closet for an hour and, you know, meditate on God's word to pray. It can totally. literally be just that simple prayer. And he hears you and he knows your yes. heart. And sometimes that is all we have, like in those hard right. moments. And then also that what comes to mind is just, you know, you talked about sharing and people reaching out. I, I often think about like, you know, having other people are carrying that burden. If you can't pray, like they are, are yes. praying for you in that moment, because I've known that feeling of being like, yes. I just can't pray about this right now. I just can't do it. And right. that is why those people come along and, 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 and the, and the Holy spirit, you know, is interceding yes. for you as well at all times. And so I think just those little reminders that it doesn't have to be some big played out thing. It's literally step-by-step step, day by day. 
Um, Absolutely. It's a great Absolutely. reminder for anyone going through like anything hard. Um, right. So I was- Any type of pain. Yes, pain is pain. And that's the thing, like we are not, just because we've had this dramatic soap opera, I mean, pain is pain is a universal condition. And it's, if you haven't had a painful time, I hate to say at some point it may or may you not know, be coming to you or someone that you love, you know, and maybe, you know, crisis isn't going to hit you, but you're going to walk alongside someone closely in your life, you know, and that's just where, yeah, I mean, just saying his name, Jesus, I mean, he hears that he, he you know, like, I love that just one word prayers. I mean, there's power in his name and, and I just can't forget that. Yeah. One word prayers. I'm going to be going off that for a little while. I think I might yes. do a series on that or something. Um, yes. So talk about how having a special needs sibling has impacted your other kids' lives. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. And um, I feel like it's ebbing and flowing because we started off with, you know, Bennett was the oldest brother. So he was all Jackson and Reagan knew. And, um, you know, by the time that they were like one and three, two and four, you know, I'd have their preschool friends running through the house and Bennett sitting there in his wheelchair, listening to the wiggles, jamming out with all the commotion around. And I remember a little preschool friend saying, wait, why can't he talk? Or wait, what's wrong with him? Why can't he walk? You know, and I remember at that, that time as a mom, I just felt like, well, here we go. It's game time. You know, we either believe what we believe or we're going to fizzle into a puddle. And I said, oh, Bennett, you know, from then on, it was, oh, Bennett was born really sick. His brain got really hurt. But you know, he can hear you. He can, he can laugh. He loves wiggles, you know, da, da, da. Oh, but why? Why is he sick? Well, we're not quite sure. But guess what? One day when, we're, when we all get to heaven, he's going to be able to walk and talk. And he's probably going to be faster than Jackson. And he's probably going to root for this baseball team, you know, and just kind of that. That has been, I love preschoolers in that way. They are mm -hmm. so honest. They ask the best, most precious question. And it kind of got, it, like it was game time. Here we go. And so, so, the, so the typical siblings have always been hearing that. But then of course, now that they are now nine and 11, like almost tweenish, getting in all the feelings and mommy, you're embarrassing. You know, I'm embarrassing them all the time. And I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> you're not even 13 yet. But um. You know, it's getting tough. I'll be totally honest. Bennett is, um, I say he's a typical man. He likes what he likes. He likes to be home. He likes to be watching his shows and he doesn't really like to do anything outside of his routine. And sometimes when we do go to church or a friend's house or the store, you know, he'll scream and cry and just face it up his way of saying, take me back to the van. Um, and for the little guys, it's, it's, it's getting to be tough because they're saying, mom, mommy, you know, is he going to come to my game and scream, you know, and can he just stay home with, you know, our babysitter? And, um, and we, that is, that is a new um, journey that we're on because as a family, Travis and I want nothing more than for our family of five to be together everywhere we go. I mean, that it, when Ben is not with us, there's like a dull ache in our hearts because it's just, we want him with us. Um, but what we're realizing is that's not always most honoring to him and it's really not most honoring to um, Jackson and Ring and our typical siblings. And so some weeks we get it right. And we're just like, everybody's kind of taken care of in the way they need. And some, some weeks everyone's in tears by the end of the weekend, because it all went terrible. And, you know, Bennett screamed, da, 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 da. he got embarrassed. You know, there was no way to get Bennett into a non handicap accessible building, you know, and it's just stress and headache. And um, so that's something that we're praying about a lot right now. And, um, you know, I do think our two younger kids, I would say, are definitely more um, just aware and compassionate in that way. I mean, they'll say, mommy, there's no ramp, you know, how are you going to get them up? And I don't think most kids are looking for ramps, you know, to get into certain doors. Um, but it's, I'm not going to be Pollyanna. It's not easy in that way. And we are really trying our best to give them as quote unquote, normal of a childhood as possible because Travis and I both, you know, we're involved in sports and church and community and activities. And we want that for them so much. Um, and we want Bennett alongside of us, but if that's not where he is happiest, then we're kind of looking into kind of, um, yeah, sitters and kind of just caregivers at our home and that, all of that. So, mm -hmm. um, I would say it's, we're a work in progress. <laughs> yeah. Well, we all are in our own way. So that yep. makes sense. Yep. Um, okay. So I want to ask you about this. Now I know you guys didn't have you didn't know before he was born that anything was going to be wrong, but some people do know. Some people do get a diagnosis where they know that they're going to have a special needs kid and they're very, very scared, um, understandably. And so I guess my question for you would be, um, what would you maybe say to someone who is facing maybe a similar circumstance, um, you know, as encouragement or as hope for them as they move forward? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. I actually just was on the phone with a mom in that in circumstance um, about a week or two ago. And, um, 
you know, I, I, some people have said, do you think it was easier that you didn't know or would it have been easier to know with that 20 week ultrasound? And I don't have an answer for that. I think either way, there's pain, there's grief, there's loss, there's shock, you name it, the, you know, the whole, the whole gamut. Um, my advice at this point is don't spend too much time on the internet because <laughs> I did that and it really doesn't make you feel much better. And number two, just cry all the tears. Cry and cry and cry as much as you need to cry. Feel and feel and feel as much as you need to feel. Um, you know, if I could go back and change anything about um, the way that we experienced everything in our <laughs> baptism into parenthood, um, you know, I guess kind of I'm more of a cup is half full, optimistic, okay, through a policy, okay, we can do that, you know, and um, even in the, in the NICU waiting room, Travis and I, we were like, welcome to the NICU waiting room, you know, oh, hello, visitor, can I get you some coffee, you know, we were so kind of um, taking care of everybody else, and welcoming, <laughs> thank you for visiting our baby, he's dying it back there in the bed, you know, just very much like we were in like autopilot mode, and right. not feeling the feelings, and not saying, hey, we're not, we're not seeing visitors, you know, today, this week, for the unforeseeable future. Thank you so much for the love. We'll let you know. We did not take care of ourselves mm. is basically what I'm saying. We were taking care of everybody else and just, I guess that fight or flight mode. And I just would encourage parents to set the boundaries that you need to take care of your heart, your mind, um, and, and don't feel guilty about it at all. I mean, you know, cause I, um, you know, my daughter, when we found out her diagnosis of her birth defect at her 20 week ultrasound, you know, I had two little boys, everyone was dying to know. They knew it was the day we were going to find out. Did she get a girl? Did she get the girl? So my phone was blowing up that day. And I just remember being like, I don't feel like talking to anybody because I just got some news that hurts my heart. And I didn't, I didn't take the calls and I didn't feel bad about it, you know? And um, I just think, I think, you know, protecting our hearts is just kind of, it's got to be step one. And, um, and obviously of course, just praying. And, and I always say God can handle, God can handle the hard questions. God can handle your sadness. He can handle your anger. He can, he can handle it. Like, yeah, keep the, that line of communication open with him. Um, don't shut him out. Even though it's really hard. I mean, disappointments are really, really hard. Yeah. I think that's great advice. I think, yeah, people don't know what to do, but it's like kind of, it sounds like the best thing is li listen to your own body <laughs> And yeah. sort of just, okay, you have an instinct to, you know, kind of close yourself off with your husband or whoever, like, that's okay. I totally, totally think that's, that's great advice. Um, what's, so today, Bennett is how old today? He's 14 and a half. Yes. He's 14 crazy. and a half. And so <laughs> you kind of explained a little bit about li what life is like, but what is he like now? What is life like? What is it like to be his mom? What makes you happy yeah. to be his mom and <laughs> all of that? Oh, I love that question. Um, yeah. And, you know, I always say Bennett's the, be the best perspective I've ever been given. You know, he, um, you know, when he was born, um, as I was saying, we had had the big baby shower. I remember I'd gotten this, you know, really nice, kind of more expensive than I would have paid for a diaper bag. I was <laughs> so excited to use. Um, you know, we were saving up for this big house that I hope to get like pottery barn rugs for, you know, I mean, whatever. Like, I mean... I just was in that mode of American young mom consumerism and there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with it. but I, you know, he's born and all of a sudden my baby can't breathe. His lungs are full of pneumonia. I'm going to be planning his funeral. I'm going to have to be greeting like acquaintances, friends, coworkers at my baby's funeral. Like I, I my heart was so broken and I just hated every time I looked at that diaper bag, you know, cause I, cause the worst thing is a mom. No, not the worst thing one of the most difficult things is when you're discharged from the hospital without your baby, you know, and, and for some people, you know, their baby's just the NICU for a week or two, but it's hard. There's just no way around yeah. it. It's easy. And I just remember going home and seeing the expensive diaper bag, you know, the clothes all, you know, clean and ready and, you know, the crib with fresh sheets on it. And, and I was, I, I, my heart was just broken. I just didn't even have any words around it. And so, um, by the grace of God, we got to bring him home and he got to wear those clothes and I got to put him in that bed, even though he was screaming like a banshee every night. And, um, but 
I've always been so grateful, like, thank you God so much that he lived, you know, and I've, we've had friends who with the best of intentions said, I'm so sorry this happened. I'm just so sorry. And I would, I remember being like, oh no, don't be sorry. Like he lived, like, had he not lived, I, you know, I don't know if I would still be standing. I hope I'd still be married. I hope I'd still be at church, you know, like, but he, he went like, I could just take care of him. And so being Bennett's mom and getting to take care of him amidst projectile vomiting, seizures, <laughs> June tube explosions, I mean, you name it. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm still changing his diaper. He's almost 15 and it's a joy. Like I, I can honestly say it's a joy. Like it's my worship at this point. I'm like, Lord, okay, you gave, I could just take care of him. Like you, you, you let me be his mom. And like, I can't get to every service project and I can't go on mission trips and I can't, um, you know, do the things that perhaps I would have seen myself doing in a, you know, n- normal motherhood. But like, it's such a joy and a gift to, to serve him in this way. And, um, you know, it's just brought me to a new place of humility and gratitude. Um, and, and in the, in the broad scheme of things, you know, there's not much that matters. You know, if all of my, if my kids are breathing, life is good. You know what? They maybe had McDonald's two times this week and they're not eating or, you know, organic applesauces and that's okay. Like I, I, I have just, I have a whole new perspective on life and I'm not judging any of that. It's just like when your baby can't breathe, you know, and then he, and then he lives, everything is different. It's a game changer. And so, um, you know, I, I just, I, every day, you know, he can't even sit up on his own. So every day when I pull up his pants, you know, swing his legs over his bed, sit him up cause to stick him into his chair. Um, he just looks up at me and gives me the biggest smile. And I call it the spec man sigh. He does this, you know, he does this sigh and it's just like pure contentment, you know, mm. and, um, from him of just like, there you are. I know I'm safe. I love you mom. It's kind mm. of this way. He just kind of gives me that. And so, you know, every day that I get that with him is a gift, you know, cause we don't know Bennett's um, life expectancy, a lot of, you know, there's just a lot of unknowns, obviously for any of us. Um, and so every day that we get with them is, is a gift, you know, and even in the hard days, you know, there have been many days and there will be many more hard days to come, especially with two little teenagers and that <laughs> help us all. But, um, you know, I just feel like his smiles, his giggles, his, um, you know, just his presence in our home. I mean, I have friends who come and they're just like, can I come sit next to Bennett? You know, I just feel good when I'm around him. Mm. And I'm like, sure. Like, he's just like this little slice of, purity, innocence. Some people say, you know, it's like a little saint's living with you, you know, and that's, that's how I feel. He hasn't been tainted by this world. I mean, I'm always like, mm. but it's fine. We are the crazy ones. Like he is so happy. <laughs> that's He's true. Like a, a direct line to Jesus. Like we are the ones who are selfish and discontent. And, you know, I mean, like he, he and so it's just, everything about our life is like countercultural, oh, but um, so cool. it's such a gift. And, and, um, yeah, I just, I feel so, so grateful to be his mom as well as Jackson and Reagan's because um, they each one bring me to my knees in different ways. <laughs> and how do you, and I'm getting to the end here, but I just, this question is on my mind. Um, how do you, how does Bennett kind of give you an eternal perspective? Because I think, you know, it's really easy when your life is you know, going well, and not that your life isn't going well, but you know, when, when you don't have like a major thing, um, to, to not be thinking eternally. And, but, but when it comes down to it, we know that this life is so short and that Mm. heaven is forever. And like you were saying, when you told the preschoolers, like one day he's going to be walking and talking. And I just read a new book, a new children's book by Johnny Erickson Tata. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's like, it's called like the wonderful, brilliant, awesome, forever, super eternal, you know, heaven party or something. No, I'm going to look for it. That's yeah. Awesome. It's really good. And you know, she's a quadriplegic. And so the whole yes. book is really about like how we're all going to be renewed in heaven. And, yes. and so that's, I mean, that matters so much. And so how does, you know, having him, help you, you know, kind of think in that way and, and direct others to think in that way. Yeah, no, I think he is, um, gosh, he's one of my, my greatest ministers, you know, I'll just say, say that, you know, I think, um, (laughs) you're going to make Kelly, you are a crazy person, (laughs) but like every day I wake up, and I mean, I, I'm kind of at a point where like nothing surprises me. I mean, I, I mean, few things surprise me, you know, like I, I kind of, with Bennett, every morning I wake up and he could have passed in his sleep. I mean, this happens regularly. I hate to say it, but at his sweet, sweet school, which is all kids with um, severe disabilities, at least once or twice a year, we get a letter, you know, in my heart. I mean, I just gasp every time I open it because 
we are all mortal. We are all fragile. And these, these precious kids are extra fragile. And so every day, you know, I, especially when he was littler and the, his lungs were just always, always so sick. And so just, you know, always had that gurgles and just, um, and he feeds overnight. And so I was always afraid he was going to aspirate. We had no nursing for the first 10 years. And so I, I was afraid, oh my gosh, if I sleep too heavy and you know, I don't hear him choke, you know, I mean, there's just this constant, his mortality was always on my mind. And, um, and so, yeah, my reliance on God in that way is just, has always been like, please, 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 you know, help me keep keep him alive basically um but, and at the same time you know I know we're, we're in a full-on midlife I mean, my husband's gonna be 45 years old and so I'm like my husband's life isn't a given you know at any point he you know my my little two are extremely active and uh, you know always out and about they get hit by a car at any moment you know I'm just kind of in this constant state of awareness of the fragility of life and and not to be Debbie Downer I'm really not Debbie Downer but like I'm just aware of it and so um, I do try and live like every day to the fullest and whatever way that, that means. I mean, usually that I'm running around like a crazy person because I'm, you know, making sure Bennett has what he needs for school and trying to encourage his teachers. He goes to an like said, awesome public school and it's, it's wonderful, but they have so many needs there and trying to support them. And then like, I've got three kids at different schools, you know, and I'm just trying to pour in everywhere that I can, as well as my husband, because I, I just don't know what I don't know, you know, and what the future holds. And so I think because of Bennett, um, I have been spurred on to just live, you know, Christ said, I've come that you might have life. I might have life to, in, in abundance. Mm -hmm. And I do feel like Bennett is that reminder of like, yes, like live life in abundance because mm -hmm. there, there days of heartbreak are ahead. You know, I know that I don't know what that will look like. Um, and so he is just like my little, my little reminder of like, you've only got, yeah. you know, one shot here and you know not to keep getting back to the book but and people are like and I even feel like is this why the book why now is this the right timing is it too soon should I wait 10 years um but you know Jesus saved God saved Bennett you know there's a specific night that we talk about in detail when the doctors were like he's going to die prepare yourself we have to take him off this machine and we said we hear what you're saying we're going to pray that he lives thank you and they ran out the door and and then it lived. And like, there's, and the next day they're like, there was no medical explanation. We do not understand why this baby's still alive. The next 24 hours are crucial. Hold on, you know, and it was just this, okay, you know, and then, so I'm like, how can I one day meet Jesus face to face in heaven? And I'm saying, why didn't you tell everyone what I did? And, and that became more and more of a pressing, like, oh my gosh, I gotta tell people. I mean, like my, my inner circle knows maybe a little bit of my outer circle knows, but like, this is power. Like, this is a powerful story and miracles still do happen. And does it, did it end in the perfect ending with a red bow tie? No, but that's okay. Like it's still a story of hope, you know? And um, so I think that's, I guess Bennett's life has just given me the boldness and the courage to share it, you know, in a way that I probably wouldn't be as bold and courage, courageous yeah. um, without him. So I'm so grateful for that. Okay. Well now that, yeah, I, I do want to talk about the book. So, um, so <laughs> Yeah, no, I, no, I want to talk about, um, you know, tell us about it. I mean, I, I know it's your story that you've already told us, but you know, how did it come to be? And, um, I know it's coming out very soon or probably yeah. by the time this airs, it will be out. So scratch awesome. that, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, no, so tell us more. Well, no, thank you so much. Okay. So it's just called hope in the heartache. Um, cause hope has been with us the whole time. And obviously that hope is Jesus for us. I always say Bennett is like our little force gump because because of him, we have been to Nats games in the white house and you just had all these crazy, crazy experiences. Cause we've got this little force that we get to, to live with. Um, but he, <laughs> when, um, COVID happened, as we all know, we live outside of DC and things were just extra crazy here. And, um, the schools were shut down like for a long time. And then, um, and, like I said, he's in a public school, but my other two kids are in a private school. And so long story short, they were saying, oh, the private schools can't open. Nobody can open, you know, da, 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 da. And I was behind a bullhorn saying, let us try, you know, like, this is insane. Like, our, you know, 
anyway. So I met this feisty woman. I love feisty women. And I met her yeah. and I never meet a stranger and say, let's be Facebook friends. But I was like, this, this lady is really cool. We became Facebook friends. And like a month or two later, she's like, I just took a new marketing position. If anyone's ever wanted to write a book, reach out, let me know. And I was like, oh my gosh. Because at this point, I'd always had the desire. <laughs> what, not even, I didn't even have a manuscript. This is the crazy thing. I was, I've always wanted to tell Ben a story. I had like journal entries. I reach out to her. She's like, hey, send me a paragraph. I'll send it to my, my the owner of our publishing firm. I did a paragraph and then he wrote back directly and he was like, I don't know if it's just because I had a, we just had our second baby or what, but your paragraph moved me to tears. Please keep writing. And so they basically partnered with me to help me write a manuscript and then edit it, market it, print it, the whole shebang. So the whole thing, and they aren't a Christian publisher by any means at all. And I just said, faith is a huge part of our story. I can't water that down. I can't take it out. Our story isn't a story with our faith. And they said, don't change anything. Just tell, tell it, tell it how it is. And so a couple of times I put on the brakes and I was like, uh, you know, is this the wrong timing? Are we trying to get attention? Are we trying to exploit Bennett? But then I feel like God has just said, no, this is not about you. This is about me. And he just kept pushing the gas to get this book out. And so it's now out. There's no turning back. It's coming out May 31st is our release date. Um, we do have some, we got some early copies kind of unexpectedly. And so if anyone would like a copy, before May 31st, you can go to hopeintheheartache.com and order. But um, yeah, I mean, it's such a privilege to be able to share a story. I just can't even believe, I keep pinching myself, but um, I just, we just hope it's an encouragement to anyone in pain. And that's what I was gonna say, back to Forrest Gump. So because of Bennett's life, we have Christians in our life, but we have non-Christians, Jews, Muslims, atheists, you name it. Like we've had so many people come alongside us um, in, in Bennett's life. And I just hope that this book is a message of hope and peace and joy. Um, and that in whatever pain people are experiencing, it doesn't have to be a child with disabilities. Um, pain is pain. So yeah, that's amazing. I mean, that is uh, the dream for a book for most people, you know, to have it kind of like in a way land in your lap, sort of, um, sort to, of, yeah. to meet someone, <laughs> to meet someone that yeah. like offered to help you. That's amazing. But it just kind of goes to show you, like, it really does seem like you know, God was really um, making this happen because it is a story that should be told and is going to bring hope. And I mean, this is literally one of the hardest things that anyone can experience. Um, and there's a lot of parents out there, I think, that will benefit from it, specifically for this kind of situation. But like you said, there's all kinds of hard situations that we go through. And so reading about someone else's and then you still having this hope and this joy, um, I think that's going to bring a lot to people. So, uh, I so I do just want to plug one quick thing, just yeah. coming out of COVID, you know, where mental health has never been more, um, of a crisis. Let's just say that I have a lot of friends with teenagers, especially who have taken the brunt of COVID. It's just devastating and so hard. Um, and my husband has a chapter. He's always like, I got one chapter. You want me to sign it? But he, it's my favorite chapter. It's Travis's chapter, chapter 14. And he talks about um, kind of his great pain. And, and I'll just, I won't spoil it, but he definitely um, being the father and caretaker, caretaker and provider. I and mean, most of the time he's been our sole provider, not sole provider. I've always worked a little bit, but main provider and just kind of, um, yeah, depression, prescription drug abuse. I mean, he's very open and candid about his struggles and then how mm -hmm. um, the Lord has brought support and healing, you know, through a, a, an array of ways. Um, once again, there's not like, here's what you do, but what's worked for him. And we just really, really want to be um, open and honest and transparent about that because I think a lot of, well, just parents in general are struggling. I mean, as you've been so open with about sobriety and um, yeah, we have just worked to, to cope in ways that are not helpful and are really only causing more harm. And there's just, there is freedom and there's healing. And um, we are just completely willing to be honest about our journey in hopes that that encourages others. And if there's any way that we can um, help, you know, our, our email is on our website, hopeintheheartache.com. You know, please reach out, especially for dads and men. I feel like it's almost this unspoken. Um, True. No one wants to talk about yeah. how hard it can be. And like, we just really want to be, um, encouragement. Yeah. So. And I feel like women are just more likely to sort of gather and, you know, guys are a little bit less uh, likely to kind of look for the support they need. So that's a really good point. Um, well, I always like to end things, of course, by just asking if you have anything you've been reading lately or that's inspired you or that you can recommend to listeners. 
Yeah. Um, I will say, so after writing a book, I was like, so brain dead, I will say. Yeah. <laughs> so I haven't been the best reader, but I did pick back up. I had started this a while back. Um, the Mama Bear Apologetics. You know, I love that. You know, yes, I love that. I, I was going to say. <laughs> and I, I am loving that. I am loving that. And um, I'm probably the ages of my kids, you know, as we are just dabbling in technology and really not wanting to go there and just, just the world in general. And so that is really feeding my soul right now. Um, yeah. It's yeah. a terrifying world that we live in. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, I'm literally terrified of the team. We need, I know. Life. I mean, you're obviously, you're way closer than me, but I'm, I'm starting to think about it. Just get prepared. <laughs> totally. Well, it's baby steps. I mean, yeah, I, I just, I really am finding um, some really great just meeting there for teaching life yeah. and just conversations to spark with my little guy. Yeah. So yeah, I'm loving, loving that. Um, that's probably my main, my main book. Right okay. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, Kelly, for sharing your story. I think it's going to be real encouragement to a lot of people. Thanks for so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Erica. It's been a true delight. You are awesome. Thank you for everything that you're doing. Um, I'm just, I'm really fired up to follow you and see what God's doing in your life.